Today, I'm going to explain why different parts of the world have such different climates, why some parts of the world are really hot, while others are really cold, why some parts of the world are very dry, while others are very wet. <laughs> it all starts with the sun. That's what's driving the weather. Sunlight hits the globe at different angles. At the equator, it hits the ground head on. But at the poles, it's coming in at an angle. Let's look at two patches of ground, one at the North Pole and one at the equator. Both these patches are the same size, but the equator patch gets more sunlight because the light is hitting it directly. That's why it's so hot at the equator. Over the course of a year, the angle of the sun changes. As the Earth orbits the sun, the angle of its axis changes with respect to the sun. In July, the North Pole is pointed towards the sun, giving the North more sunlight, which means it's hot and it's summer. In January, it points away from the sun, meaning it's cold and it's winter. The angle of the sun also changes over the course of a day. That's why it's hottest in the middle of the day, because sunlight is hitting us more directly. But as the sun goes down, it's coming in at an angle. Also, notice how quickly the temperature is changing on land, and how slowly it changes in the oceans. Imagine a sunny day at the beach. The sun is shining on both the water and the sand, but only the sand gets really hot. This is because water has a higher heat capacity than land, and because the water is circulating. So the land changes temperature more easily than water. You also may notice that the mountains are especially cold. As you go up in elevation, the pressure of the air decreases. When you lower the air pressure, the air cools down. When you compress air, it heats up. Expansion and compression explain how your fridge works. What your fridge is doing is it's using these principles to take heat from inside the fridge and move it out of the fridge. In your fridge, you have a bunch of tubes filled with a refrigerant. The refrigerant changes between a liquid and a gas. When it enters the fridge, it's expanded. When you expand the refrigerant, that cools it down. Now that it's cold, it can absorb heat from inside the fridge. Now as the refrigerant leaves the fridge, you compress it. This heats it up. Now we have a lot of hot gas outside the fridge. The gas runs through a bunch of coils and the heat dissipates away. Then the cycle repeats itself. The refrigerant comes in, it's expanded, and it cools. Then it absorbs heat from the inside. When it leaves, it's compressed. This heats it up and the heat dissipates away. Pressure also affects the temperature of the atmosphere. Air pressure is high near the surface because gravity is pulling the air down, compressing it at the bottom. Now, as you go up, there's less air pressure. Less pressure means less temperature, so mountains are cold. Here we see lines of equal pressure. This line shows you where the pressure is exactly 500 millibars. Now, normally these pressure lines are pretty flat, and I'll tell you why. Imagine something disrupts the air and changes the air pressure. Now, as soon as that happens, the air begins to move. Air moves from high pressure to low pressure. You may be familiar with this. This is wind. By moving from high to low pressure, the wind flattens out these pressure lines. Now let's talk about water. There's water vapor in the air, and the amount of water depends on the temperature. Hot air holds more water than cold air. This graph shows you how much water vapor you can hold at a given temperature. When it's hot, the air holds more water. Have you ever gone outside and seen a layer of dew on the ground? Where did this water come from? It came from the air. During the day, it was warm, and the air held lots of water. But at night, it got cold, and the air could no longer hold this water. So it condensed on the ground, and that's what dew is. Let's imagine what would happen if we take some air and we lift it up. Now, as it's lifted, there's less pressure. So the air expands, and then it cools. Now that it's cold, it can no longer hold so much water, so the water condenses. And this is how clouds are made. Now what could cause the air to be lifted like this? 
imagine you have humid air passing over a mountain range. As the air passes over, it's lifted up so it expands and it cools. The cold air can no longer hold so much water, so the water condenses, forming clouds and rain. When the air makes it over the mountain, the water has all been sucked out of it. And as it goes down, it gets compressed and it heats up and we're left with hot, dry air. So the windward side of the mountain gets all the rain and the other side gets nothing. We see this effect all over the world. Between California and Nevada, there's a mountain range called the Sierra Nevadas. We have humid air coming in from the Pacific. As the air goes up the mountains, the water condenses and it rains. By the time the air reaches Nevada, the water's gone. So on one side of the mountains, we have green farm fields, and the other side has Death Valley. And this is why California is so green, and Nevada is not. Why did I come here? Let's look at another way we can get rain. If you've ever been to Florida in the summer, you know that it rains there all the time. Why? Well, earlier we saw that land changes temperature more quickly than water. During the day, the land gets really hot. The air heats up. Now hot air expands. It's less dense than cold air. So the air is expanding and rising. And that changes the pressure. Above Florida, there's an area of high pressure. Wind moves from high pressure to low pressure. Now to recap, the land is getting hot, the air is rising, and then the air moves from being over the land to being over the ocean. There's now more air sitting on top of the ocean pressing down. This gives us a higher surface pressure over the ocean. Now wind moves from high pressure to low pressure. So at the surface, there's a breeze coming in from the sea known as the sea breeze. We started with just a change in temperature, and this caused all the air to start moving. At the surface, we have a low pressure zone over the land where hot air is rising. The air that's coming in from the ocean has lots of water. This air gets lifted up. As it's lifted, it expands and it cools. Cold air can't hold as much water as hot air, so it starts raining. And that's why it rains so much in Florida. Temperature differences cause pressure differences, which cause wind. This process is called convection. Convection happens on a small scale when you build a campfire or when you boil a pot of water. The stove is like Florida. Convection also happens on a much larger scale. And we'll talk about this in a minute. But first, let's talk about something else that's happening on a very large scale. The Earth is spinning. And this spinning motion changes the way that objects move on Earth. This is known as the Coriolis force. Now, it's a very complicated topic, and I made another video about this. But all you really need to know is this. When the wind blows in the northern hemisphere, it's constantly being pushed to the right. When the wind blows in the southern hemisphere, it's being pushed to the left. Now, let's look at how air moves on a global scale. This is similar to what we saw in Florida. Remember, the equator is really hot, the poles are really cold, and hot air expands. So we have a lot of expanded air sitting high above the equator, but the air stays compressed over the poles. Air moves from high pressure to low pressure. So high altitude winds move the air from being above the equator to being above the pole. But now we have more air sitting over top the pole, giving us more surface pressure there. Wind moves from high pressure to low pressure. So at the surface, we expect the wind to be moving from the pole to the equator. This is what would happen if the Earth was not spinning. But the Earth is spinning. So there's a Coriolis force pushing the air to the right in the northern hemisphere. The air does not travel from equator to poles. It keeps getting deflected to the right. Instead of moving in one big circulation pattern from equator to poles, the air actually moves in three circulation patterns. These are called cells, and this is the three-cell model of the Earth. What if the Earth was spinning at a different rate? If it was spinning slower, it'd be like Venus. Venus takes over 200 Earth days to spin around. What if Earth was spinning faster? Well, then it would be like Jupiter, 
which only takes about 10 hours to spin around. By the way, Venus is the only planet that's spinning backwards. On Venus, the sun rises in the west. Venus is spinning very slowly, so the Coriolis force is very weak. Venus has one cell, going from equator to pole. Earth is spinning faster, so the Coriolis force is stronger and splits the air into three cells. And on Jupiter, it's strong enough to split it into many cells. So what's the effect of all this air moving around? What's happening is that hot air is moving away from the equator and cold air is coming in. So this is cooling off the equator and it's warming up the poles. It's moderating the world's temperatures. Now you probably think, man, it's doing such a lousy job. The equator is still really hot and the poles are still really cold, but not so fast. You don't really understand what it's up against. It could be worse. The average temperature at the North Pole is about negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. At the equator, it's about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Now imagine, what if the Earth had no air and no water? Well, then it would be a lot like the moon. And the moon is negative 200 degrees at night and plus 250 degrees during the day. So Earth's air and water is actually helping us out quite a bit. In my next video, I'm going to put all the pieces together and explain why different parts of the world have such different climates using all the tools we've learned. Here's a quick preview. Along the equator, we have very warm air that holds lots of water. The warm air is expanding and rising. As it rises, it cools down. And so it can no longer hold so much water, so it rains a lot. All around the equator, we have the world's great tropical rainforest, the Amazon, the Congo, and Indonesia. So this air had all this water in it, but it lost it over the equator. The air moves north, and the air comes down about 30 degrees north. When the air comes down, it comes down as hot, dry air. And so this is where many of the world's deserts are found, like the Sahara. They're right where this dry air is coming down. I'll explain more in my next video. For more astronomical videos, please click to subscribe. Mm, astronomical.